Good morning. Uh, my name is Ken McIntosh, and as presenting officer, it's my pleasure to uh, open the 11th business in the, conf business in the Parliament conference. And to those of you who have attended uh, previous conferences, welcome back. To the first timers, the warmest of welcomes to you. And to fellow diners from last night, I hope we can continue the conversation. Uh, our theme this year is Leading Scotland, Unlocking Our Economic and Business Potential. And when the, the Irish president, Michael D. Higgins, and he stood here, he addressed the parliament last year, he said, Scotland has long been a source of illumination for the other nations of the world, from the lighthouses of the Stevenson family to the dazzling early promise of the Scottish Enlightenment. And that illumination is what we need now. Leadership that shows the way not only within these shores, but without. Politically, we live in what is frequently described as interesting times. You wait ages for a referendum and then two come along at once. Elections are called snap, and some would say crackle and pop. Leadership contests come and go and come again. And that's before we even mention the B word. Uh, the UK's decision to leave the EU will continue to dominate parliamentary time here and at Westminster for the months and years to come. As with the economy, forecasts suggest that Scotland rebounded in the first quarter of this year. Production grew by 3.1%. The services industry grew by 0.3%. Only the southeast and the southwest of England have lower employment rates. Tourism enjoyed a bumper year. And there are signs the jobs downturn from the oil and gas sector may have levelled off. But on the other side of the coin, Price inflation is up. We talk of the gig economy, the economic precariat, and pay packets are squeezed. Now, I am not an economist, but as Kenneth Boulding put it, mathematics brought rigor to economics. Unfortunately, it also brought mortis. I'm pleased to say our speakers today are all rigor and no mortis. So more on them in a moment. But first, some housekeeping. Feel at liberty to tweet take photographs or otherwise engage through social media and our hashtag is BIPC is it here? I'm not sure it's BIPC 2017 so business in the parliament conference 2017 and please make sure though your devices are on silent mode business in the parliament is a shared venture of the Scottish parliament and the Scottish government and I would thank members of the economy jobs and fair work committee and the parliamentary staff for delivering this event and I also want to thank the Scottish government and ministers and officials for their invaluable input. And finally, I want to thank all of those of you who will be speaking in our workshops uh, this morning. But most importantly, we want everyone to have their say, whether in the workshops, chats, over coffee, or quizzing the cross-party uh, panel this afternoon. These conferences work because of you. So to our speakers, in reverse order of appearance, the First Minister is our final speaker in this segment of the programme, and I think Nicola Surgeon needs little introduction. Even seasoned political journalists here uh, know and refer to her by her first name only. She's appeared on The Daily Show, Desert Island Discs, and The Tracy Ullman Show, even if her real self was only on, one of those, on two of those. Uh, Leah Hutchinson may be another uh, figure to you, founder and CEO of Appointed. Leah also starred in BBC Two's The Entrepreneurs and won last year's Scotland's Accelerator Prize. She loves startups, girl geeks, and the noises of elephants and crazy birds from Edinburgh Zoo. And that's her words, not mine. Before Leah, Leah we'll hear from Nora Senior. In 2013, Nora became president of the British Chamber of Commerce, becoming the first woman to occupy the post in a decade and just the second in 150 years. And Nora was recently appointed chair of the new strategic board for enterprise and skills. But ahead of the first minister, Leah and Nora, Gordon Lindhurst will present the views from the committee. And Gordon is an advocate by profession, was elected as an MSP for the Lothians in 2016. He's a fluent German speaker and was educated and studied European law at Heidelberg University. It's a seat of learning where the alumni include 31 Nobel laureates and five chancellors of Germany, but only one convener of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. So Gordon Lindhurst, over to you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, um, First Minister, when she arrives, I think she's not here just yet. Uh, guest speakers, 
fellow MSPs, uh, I do beg your pardon, First Minister. <laughs> I had, I had uh, stood up without looking back properly to where I'd come from. So I'll start again. Presiding officer, <laughs> First Minister, guest speakers, fellow MSPs, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. This is the 11th Business in Parliament Conference. It is, however, the first that it's been my pleasure to address. Our theme this year is Leading Scotland, Unlocking Our Economic and Business Potential. I'm sure the other speakers will have plenty to say in the matter, but first let me tell you a little bit about them. Norris Senior's professional skills include strategic counsel, reputational management, and crisis control. So some MSPs may be looking for advice from her. That's very much our day job. Um, the award for outstanding UK business achievement, the first women UK media award, best company executive for Europe, the Middle East and Africa, and she is also twice winner of the global Stevie for best women in business award. Her mantelpiece must really be creaking by this stage. In this year's birthday honours, she was awarded a CBE for services to Scottish business, and that, of course, included in particular her five years as chair of Scottish Chambers and Commerce. The First Minister also highlighted Nora's work in raising the profile of women and young people in business. She was born in St Andrews, studied at Glasgow, and this was before she made her way into the world of public relations. Uh, PR, of course, is a profession which is held in almost as high a regard as law and politics. And I say that as a lawyer and now a politician. Uh, Nora is a fan of Formula One racing and of poetry, in particular the works of Goethe and Scotland's own Liz Lochhead. Now, Goethe is one of these world-famous poets that is... I've found not that famous outside Germany, a bit like every country has things which it thinks are world famous. So um, Goethe is, of course, a great poet and one that I've had the joy of appreciating some of his work as well, although not many of you may have heard of him. Leah Hutchin is Blackpool born and studied English and drama at Queen Margaret University. I am told that her first job was dressing up as Mr. Blobby for children to have their photo taken with the inflatable menace. It's true what they say, presiding officer, there really is no business like show business. She has worked in the theater, edited a magazine, and freelanced as a copywriter. Uh, that was before her frustration at trying to book a hair appointment led to a light bulb moment. The next thing she knew, she was starring in a reality TV show on BBC Two. Appointed, her company, is an online, sorry, online booking management system which revolutionizes how businesses sell their time online. She is now an ambassador for Women's Enterprise Scotland and a director of Future Leaders for Entrepreneurial Scotland. Your product is never finished, she says, and I'm quoting, you need to superpower yourself and your team. And I'm again sure that's a quote that is as apt for MSPs as those in the business community. She has spoken candidly about her confidence belying a massive case of imposter syndrome. Again, a quote. Um, and I'm sure there are times when we all feel like that, perhaps even first ministers. Now, Nicola Sturgeon has been in the top job uh, for coming up to three years. Uh, I understand that once upon a time she thought of becoming a children's author before she was drawn to politics and began to write a story of a very different kind. Last year, our first female first minister was ranked number 50 in Forbes World's Most Powerful Women list. But did you know that she secretly has a second job? Now, this came as a bit of a surprise courtesy of the news and media website Vox, which last month ran a story on US healthcare proposals using stock images to go with the article. One of them was of a woman peering into a microscope in a life science laboratory in Glasgow. 
wearing protective goggles, a white overcoat, and blue gloves, and bearing more than just a passing resemblance to the First Minister. But the plot thickens. This isn't the first time such a picture has featured online. The technology site Engadget also posted an image of her looking down a microscope to illustrate a story about cell technology. Coincidence, or could it be part of the strategy to encourage more women into STEM subjects? Or is Nicola Sturgeon hinting at a change of career? I think we should be told. So I look forward to hearing what the First Minister, Leah Hutchin, and Nora Senior have to say. But before that, may I offer a brief overview of my committee's work. We've completed inquiries into the economics of leaving the EU, the Scottish Government's climate change plan, and its draft energy strategy. We've also published our report called No Small Change, the Economic Potential of Closing the Gender Pay Gap. I'll limit my remarks to the EU work and the gender pay gap. Uh, it was thought appropriate at the time, rewinding a year now, to look at the economic impact of the decision to Brexit. And I think probably many people have been talking about Brexit much of the time since. But we as a committee wanted to learn, understand, and convey the views of employers and employees in Scotland in the circumstances we face. Should Scotland target the rest of the world rather than selling our wares to the EU? The European Policy Centre said it was about both. Other witnesses pointed out how much of our trade was with the rest of the UK, what's known as the proximity effect. Yet the fastest growing economies of today are India and China, where our sales remain very low. So should we be pessimistic at the post-Brexit outlook? Scotland Food and Drink highlighted the potential in premium markets and tapping into consumers' desires for quality, authenticity, and provenance. And I think some of our guests at the dinner last night did just that after the dinner. But we need to encourage a more international mentality. We were reminded that 50% of our exports are still generated by just 50 companies. The Cabinet Secretary, who will be speaking later, said more needed to be done to expand the export base. And this was part of the thinking behind Mr. Brown's review of the enterprise agencies. Inward investment was the second strand of our inquiry, and we learned that Scotland has had its successes. But SCDI told us we'd done less well in securing money from new sources, that China did not feature in Scotland's top 10 sources of investment. We welcomed a commitment to do more, to offer core support to more Scottish businesses. SMEs need our backing now more than ever. And the relationship with our overseas partners in trade is going to change. I think we can all agree on that. Um, whether we like it or not is quite another matter. And the final strand in our inquiry was the labor market. Some sectors, pelagic fish and soft fruits, for example, are reliant on EU workers from outside the UK, both skilled and unskilled. We also have an aging population and labor growth is relatively slower than the rest of the UK. So the distinct needs of Scotland's economy should be borne in mind in negotiations. Uh, was this a straightforward inquiry into the EU? Members of the committee, you'll be shocked to hear this, as politicians did not always agree. However, a cooperative approach prevailed. Now, gender pay was our most recent piece of work. We found that women were still concentrated in low paid and part-time work, and that the pay gap primarily affects women. And also that it cannot simply be explained by taking time out to start a family. So we made a number of recommendations, including that care be made a priority sector, because continuing as it does to be one of the lowest paid female-dominated sectors in Scotland, it should be a priority. Supporting everyone, female and male, to achieve their full potential is imperative, and that will take ambition, innovation, and a shift in cultural thinking. Leadership, in other words. But the benefits could be considerable. 
The committee's current inquiry is economic data. Now, you might think that's a rather niche topic. However, I'm sure that you'll all understand that data and information is vital to looking how we go forward as a country in our economy. And after that, we will turn to look at Scotland's economic performance, which are, is our very theme today. Presiding officer, thank you for your remarks about Heidelberg University. And as an alumnus of Heidelberg, I'd like to close with the motto of that university, Semper Apertus, always open. It is, I hope, a spirit shared by our gathering today. Thank you. And I would now like to invite our first keynote speaker, Nora Senior CBE, who is chair of uh, UK Regions in Ireland uh, of the global PR firm Weber Shamrock. Thank you very much. Thank you, First Minister, uh, fellow Scots. Good morning. And I was so interested to hear that Leah um, had uh, had to dress up as Mr. Blobby, one of my. Uh, first tasks when I started out in um, employment, gainful employment or ungainful employment, was to dress up as a banana uh, and open a Dumfries uh, retail store. So I'm just wondering if there's a kind of correlation between starting out your career in that sense and, and ending up with some sort of business success. But to the matter of the day, um, the, today's, or the overarching theme of Business and Parliament Conference this year is Leading Scotland, Unlocking Our Economic and Business Potential. And as you've just heard, I have recently been appointed to the new Strategic uh, Board of the Enterprise and Skills System. Um, Enterprise and skills are very important drivers of our and any uh, economy. The creation of new business, uh, the development of existing businesses provide choice uh, employment, um, competition, more importantly they feel the process of um, innovation and they bring wealth to the local area that they are based in and it underpins the well-being of our society. The system of um, enterprise support and skills development is a critical element to business success, I believe, which is why in um, May last year, the First Minister um, announced an end-to-end -end review of our economic agencies to ensure that they were delivering the right type of joined-up support uh, that our young people, our universities, our colleges, our training providers and our businesses and the workforce need to achieve economic success. And why is that important? Well, at the moment, Scotland is not growing fast enough. And as Gordon rightly pointed out, there is a, a, sh a small uplift, but it's not straining to its full potential. And there's parts of our society and civic and regional communities that are getting left behind. So it's time for a different way of looking at the enterprise and skills agenda and being more transparent and more accountable for the return on the collective investment that we make in and across Scotland. And the result of that review was um, to recommend that the enterprise and skills support system should have a singular point of focus in a strategic board and that the delivery agencies should um, align themselves behind a single strategy. So what is that strategy? Well, that's a very good question and I'm only two weeks in the job, so I, I haven't come with a fully formed plan. So today I thought I'd uh, just share with you um, some of the thoughts and processes that are going through my mind. So let's start with um, Scotland's strengths. Well, there's no doubt that Scotland has a raft of strengths, textiles, defence, whisky, food and drinks, microelectronics financial services, life sciences, the list could go on sectors that perform well. But let's also look at the fluctuations of um, Scotland's economic growth over the past 10 years. You know, Scotland withstood the turmoil of the financial crisis in 2007-2008 uh, relatively robustly. We've also then had the challenges um, of the, um, the, the oil and gas sector with the price downturn. But, then, but since then, Scotland's GDP has tended to grow at a, um, a, a, a slower pace than the rest of the UK. And forecasts um, for the Scottish economy uh, over the next few years are to grow about 1%, which obviously is at the lower end of where the trend um, uh, is, is currently at in other um, uh, European countries. And specifically looking at Brexit, there is still um, a, a great deal of uncertainty ahead of us, and that's a factor that we need to look at. 
So the stated goal of ministers was to move Scotland up into the top quartile of OECD countries for productivity, equality and well-being and sustainability. And the strategic board's role will be to look at how enterprise and skills support can be directed and channeled to help achieve that ambition. But what does being in the upper quartile mean? Well, there's a couple of barometers uh, to look at. Productivity. Scotland's level of productivity um, in terms of output per hour worked um, puts us near the bottom of the second quartile um, of the OECD countries. And to match the top performing countries, the economy would need to be at least 27% uh, more productive. Scotland needs to reduce down uh, the, that 12% of population age between 16 and 64 who have no or low qualifi qualification skills. And that actually jumps to 14% um, as a figure amongst ethnic communities. And it um, jumps to 25% um, amongst adult population in disadvantaged areas. So there is a, there is a, a need to look at um, upskilling. Scotland needs 6,000 more exporting businesses, that's 42% more uh, to uh, reach the, the UK nation and region top quartile. Scotland needs to triple investment in business, R&D, um, and spend another £1.9 billion to reach the top quartile. Scotland needs to triple investment, um, uh, or um, it needs to uh, invest for business, with business investment, another £7 billion. Um, in uh, or to reach the, the top quartile at the, at the moment, business investment only accounts for 18% of GDP, which puts us in the fourth quartile. And we need to raise that and aspire to 25%. And when it comes to in innovation, the percentage of businesses with 10 or more employees that are innovation active is 56.4%. That puts, puts us into the second quartile of, the, of OECD countries. And you know, you know how much it would take to get us into the top quartile? Another 680 businesses. Only 680 businesses. So it's not such an insurmountable total, is it? But those are performance gaps that we need to address. And there are a number of factors that are obviously going to significantly impact on shifting the dial on, on in, um, economic growth. Investment in infrastructure, in housing, in childcare, health, energy, technology, people. The, the strategic board is not going to uh, have direct levers to change those issues, but it will look to influence where the impact on the aims of the strategic board. But my question to you at this point as businesses is what can business contribute to shifting the dial on those performance measures that I've just outlined? And what can the enterprise and skills system do to support your ambitions in doing that. You know, the reality is at the heart of growth lies knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge, the teaching of knowledge, the usage of knowledge about what can be made, how it can be made, and the capabilities and the competencies of um, people who have the ability to create and use that knowledge. And let me just say a couple of things about technology and the capabilities of people. For me, technology underpins um, underpins economic growth wherever you look. It disrupts markets, it creates new markets. Businesses using technology to exchange knowledge between employees and companies to drive ideas and innovation and achieve cost efficiencies and operational efficiencies. Investment in R&D and technology to um, create improvements in productivity and the commercialization of new technologies and innovations which can be um, sold and exported overseas like medical informatics or energy informatics. You know, most of our businesses in Scotland, you know, they're not high tech, they are not producing blue sky products yet. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that companies producing everyday products and services shouldn't be employing technology to improve efficiencies. Scottish businesses tend to perform worst on the take-up and use of certain digital business tools. Yes, we do score very highly. We've all got websites and um, email, 87% of us at least, but only 6% employ um, resources like enterprise resource planning. That's compared to Sweden. About 43% of, of uh, businesses there do. 19% use uh, customer relationship management and only 8% use supply chain management. So more businesses need to explore new technologies like cloud, like machine learning, like AI, 
you know, there's potential to transform back office functions and enhance performance, and we should be using them. And as a nation, we're also not using data as well as we uh, should. The richer the data, the more precise the insights, the better the outcomes. If you look at industry leaders like Amazon, like Dell, like Skyscanner, through building strategies, through data-driven insights, they've been able to better identify the true drivers of their financial performance and target their best customers more directly. They've been able to accelerate product innovation and optimise supply chains. They deploy relevant technology so that they understand their clients and customers' needs and to deliver services seamlessly through a mix of different channels. And those information-based strategies have, have generated impressive business results. So as part of the strategic board's thinking, um, we'll be looking at how we embed technology and analytics across businesses and in the skills of our people particularly looking at jobs for the future. And skills particularly, skills shortage and the availability um, of, um, uh, or, or the potential for disruption, if you like, on skills availability, which is going to be brought about by Brexit, means that businesses are going to have to take the initiative to place um, more emphasis on digital skills development, both inside and outside their organisations. The UK needs to fill about three quarters of a million uh, jobs across the whole tech sector. In Scotland, um, in the, in, um, in the, over the next four years, we have um, a, a need, a requirement for about 11,000 um, jobs only to, to keep us ticking over in sectors that are um, already with us. That's before we even think about new sectors that could be opening up, particularly in energy and, and fintech. So how we equip people's skill levels for, for future jobs is going to be at the heart of um, what the strategic board is looking at. And just a word about investment in people. Again, looking at, and I work all over the world, and one of the things that always strikes me is the investment that successful companies have um, in upskilling their workforce. And our, our most successful competitors are aggressively and, and affordably upskilling workforces with a focus on competencies and capabilities. Those that will drive the personal development of the individual and of the organisations that they work for. And the quality of management can be a, a key differentiator. I've got a raft of evidence that shows that poor management, poor management practices and attitudes have a big effect on low productivity. And actually you can create a disproportionate gain from just improving um, management processes and attitudes. But if I asked businesses here and out with this, um, uh, the, this auditorium, my bet would be that, our, that the spend of businesses on training and upskilling people would be far below our top performing companies. And that's actually not good enough for us as businesses. But let me just return to the strategic board and I'll just um, close by looking at some of the um, aspirations that the board has. First of all, looking to the future is being able to um, have an input into building a diverse, diverse and skilled workforce for actual employers and business activities. You know, I know that there are always tensions or until recently there have been um, uh, more tensions between employers, education and economic development agencies. And to an extent, employers have chosen to stand on the sidelines. Well, that means that what we've not been then doing is harnessing the intelligence around business activity or future job needs and requirements, neither in terms of skill nor numbers. So it's essential that we future-proof our education and skill system at all levels to ensure that we've got the right skills in place now um, to meet the, the meet, or to meet the businesses, our local businesses and national businesses, employers now and in the future. You know, we also have successful uh, city deals going through. We've got entrepreneurs creating um, new areas of work that technology have opened up. We've got new agri agricultural energy and space innovations that have huge potential. But the risk that we run is that they will um, morph off to other economies because we don't have the skills base or business support services to grow our own. And that's why the importance of a new relationship and engagement between educators, um, enterprise agencies and um, employers can't be overstated. The landscape, quite simply, has to change. 
The strategic board is, uh, will comprise the chairs of Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Funding Council, Skills Development Scotland, High, and a new agency for the, the, the south of Scotland. But more importantly, it will be populated by a number of business representatives as well as economists and representatives from across civic society and local authority. And I want to ensure that the uh, decision-making process of the strategic board will be embedded in analysis. The strategic board is going to have to make um, some robust, informed decisions about longer-term choices and priorities based on an in-depth analysis of Scotland's economic performance gaps and the actions that can impact on these. So there will be a new analytical unit that's going to help us on that. And I do hope that... Um, public sector uh, organisations, and there is a raft of, of data out there, but I hope that we can collect a wider range of data than we currently do, including user feedback, and that should be used as a more effective way to accelerate processes, share information, and create a, a user-friendly process that is much easier to navigate. And we need to establish clear metrics to measure the performance of the system and the impact of the collective investment of individual and collective interventions so we need to gather our insights but we should we need to share them not just among um, agencies and businesses we need to um, collaborate across government departments and just as our agencies need to change operationally the same challenge applies across our government departments um, all government departments need to test their thinking they need to de-risk operational real-time decisions and more accurately plan for the future needs as different forces impact the socio-economic landscape. My last aspiration, if you like, we need to find a way to be more productive and efficient, but at the same time, we want to not only generate um, more growth, but we want to generate better shared growth, more inclusive growth. We want a skilled, productive workforce, but also one that can enjoy um, uh, well-paid and secure jobs across Scotland. The well-being of, of our society and communities, for me, sits at the heart of this review and this new way forward. We're just at the start of the process, so I have more questions than answers around about performance gaps, around where Scotland's real competitive advantage lies, um, what, what are the big areas that would make a difference? What should we be looking at? Should it be sub-sea? Should it be energy? Should, should it be CCS? Where can business add most value? What are the five things that would make a strategic difference in moving that dial in Scotland's economic growth? What would start a chain reaction? We're all in it together, which I think is important. And I am clear that this is not just a short-term plan. It's a plan for the next 10 or 15 years that leaders, politicians um, of all parties, business and communities, have to contribute to and get behind. It's a golden opportunity for Scotland to create a future model of our enterprise and skills system. Scotland, um, the, uh, the First Minister said, if I'm right, um, in her speech um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Scotland not wants to just embrace but to lead um, the, technolo the key technological and social changes of the future. And I think that that encapsulates where we ought to be looking. It's not about reinventing the wheel. Enterprise and skills agencies are critical to achieving a more successful country and delivering opportunities that will support business employees um, and economic growth locally and national. By collaborating in a way that they've not done before, the system, I think, can be enhanced to deliver more than the sum of its parts. And by having a more focused and aligned strategy, a more joined up service that's easier to navigate for the user and is relevant, measurable and accountable, we stand a greater chance of um, developing our economic growth much more quickly. And that's what this is all about. So I look forward to working with you and your, in uh, your input and support. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. And we'll now hear the views uh, of our second uh, of our keynote speakers, Leah Hutchin, founder and CEO of Appointed. Leah, thank you. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> thank you very much, First Minister, Nora, Gordon. Um, thank you for outing my imposter syndrome, Gordon. It's never been more real. Um, I have been asked today to talk a little bit about the view from... Um, somebody who has started a company here in Scotland. I'm the founder and CEO of a technology company called Appointed. Um, we are 
one of the digital tools that Scotland is really bad at adopting. Um, but we are a technology platform that allows any business to take any type of booking on any platform in any time zone. And we built the world's first cross and multi-time zone technology. So we basically make it really easy for a business to take bookings from their customers or their colleagues wherever they are in the world. Um, and we turn any platform, so whether it's their own website or their Facebook page, their blog, an internal piece of software, we turn any of that into a guaranteed booking portal. So it's really about allowing customers to access a business wherever they are in the world, whatever time of day, and kind of making an on-demand booking in the same way as we would with an Uber or booking a, a takeaway online. Um, so my journey starting Appointed started when I turned up at Business Gateway, having been um, made redundant in, in the um, recession. I turned up at Business Gateway with no technology background, an idea and um, a little bit of savings um, and a bit of an overdraft. And I spoke to the people at, at Business Gateway and kind of said, you know, this is, this is where I am. Um, this is an idea I've had. I've spoken to some friends. They seem to think this, this is a good idea. Can you help me? Um, and, and that was the start of a, a huge journey where support has been um, a real theme for us. We've been lucky enough to, to benefit from a lot of the support agencies, um, both public and private here in Scotland. So Business Gateway referred me to Girl Geeks Scotland. Um, Girl Geeks is a wonderful organisation that supports um, women in technology. And they recommended me to Entrepreneurial Spark. And that was back when eSpark had just started out. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the, the second ever intake at Sir Willie Hawkey's um, Entrepreneurial Spark Hub in Glasgow. And that was when Appointed became a business. Um, at that point, we had, I say we, I, had um, outsourced the beginning of some development. So I knew that there were some legs in, in being able to build this technology. I had no technology background myself, so it was kind of really just trusting in, in the agency that we were working with in Edinburgh. And eSpark really helped me test the, the assumptions that I was making about building this business and made me realize the potential that was, was in the idea. When I was in Entrepreneurial Spark, as Gordon said, I was lucky enough to be part of a BBC Two documentary called The Entrepreneurs. And that was a fantastic experience. And um, I kind of laid myself bare a little bit in it. And quite often people will come up to me even now and say, oh, you're the girl that cried on telly. Um, but I think it was really important for people to see how difficult it is starting a business from scratch. And, I definitely would, would do it all again, um, mainly because it was the experience that made me realize quite how much um, opportunity there was in Appointed. After the show had, had aired, a few people got in touch with me and said, this thing you're doing for salons, and at this point it was just about enabling hair salons to be booked online. This thing you're doing for salons, could it work for my skip hire company? Or could it work for my language school? And, at the time, we kind of said, well, yes, theoretically, but no, because we're being very focused and we're doing everything that you're meant to do when you're starting a business. Um, when I was in The Entrepreneurs, I um, was massively lucky to win one of the very first Scottish Edge Awards. And I absolutely credit that with the reason that Appointed is here. Without that money, we, we were awarded £30,000 in the very first ever Scottish Edge Award. Without that money, I know the business wouldn't be here. Um, I know John Swinney has said in the past that it's the most impactful money he spent as Cabinet Secretary for Finance. I absolutely know it was the most impactful money we ever got because it was at a point in the business where nobody would have invested in us. We weren't a commercial entity yet. We weren't proven in any way. We had some, you know, some early technology and a good idea and a lot of passion, um, but but that money allowed me to hire my first developer and bring our technology development in-house. And so me and an idea and some outsourcers became a business of two people, which was amazing. It gave me the, the space to kind of think about the business, to create. We were building technology that our customers could rely on, and, and it gave us the opportunity to, to really commercialize. It also had an um, unexpected downside that it started the ticking time bomb of payroll. And I just, you know, 
I'd been given, awarded £30,000 and I felt like that was, you know, so much money we'd be able to achieve so much and we did. But of course, where does the next tranche of money come from? How do you keep, we've, you know, I um, convinced a fantastically talented developer to come and join me. I now needed to keep him employed. So we did what all good startups do when they're running out of money and they um, need to, to commercialize quick. We pivoted. I thought back to the conversations that I'd had with people after the entrepreneurs um, and thought, well, actually, this technology could run a skip hire company or it could run a language school. So let's look at it and let's see how we can make this bigger and, and kind of take it further. I also, that was part of, of a very difficult ideation I had in Entrepreneurial Spark where they just kind of kept saying to me, pick a lane, you have to do something, pick a lane. So that, that was the lane that we picked and we decided to become a scalable technology platform that really focused on allowing a business to take bookings from its own website. So instead of trying to be all things to all men, it was just about plugging our technology into a business's website. And this is an example of of our technology being plugged into a photographer website on um, Weebly, which is one of our partners. They're a, a global website builder. And it's just as simple as them dragging and dropping that booking technology onto the website. So it's really super easy for, for a small business to adopt. Um, and we work with, with a whole host of different businesses now, um, everything from the hairdressers, the car hire, the um, dog groomers, all sorts of different sort of SME businesses, all the way up to um, global call centers. We're negotiating a deal at the moment with one of the big four accountancy firms. Um, so we're, we're doing lots of, of different bookings, but at the heart of it, it's about putting those booking, tech, um, those booking tools onto a website. And so this then became the heart of Appointed, and this then started to resonate with people with both companies and most importantly with investors um, and so we've been able to raise two rounds of investment um, with appointed latterly um, bringing on some fantastic both money and skills and guidance um, from investors such as Gareth Williams the the CEO of Skyscanner Marie Macklin sort of people who have been able to join the company, both kind of putting their money in, but also putting their skills and their guidance and, and really taking the time to, to show us and give us the benefit of, of their experience. With that money, so we've raised £820,000 um, so far, and we're actually just raising a round of investment really to, to take our technology truly global at the moment. But with that money, um, we have been able to bring on board a world-class team. And... That was really hard to do. I think one of the things that, that came through from, from Nora's um, talk that there is a skills gap um, here and in, in the UK as, as a whole, but we're, we're a team of 14 now. We have a fantastic board on top of that. Um, and we're from that team based here in Edinburgh. We're just um, off the grass market. We've been able to, to really build out our software to the point where we are able to compete at a global level. We've just recently um, won a contract from one of our biggest US competitors um, for, for, for a Fortune 500 company to start using our technology. And that was absolutely just on the basis of our technology being much more secure and reliable than, than our competitors. So that was really testament to, to the skills in the team. But we do need to be doing more. I think we need to be teaching IT earlier. Um, and we need to be attracting more world-class companies here to Scotland because I think that then will perpetuate more skills um, being kind of grown here. So we were able to, to get product market fit and we've been able to, to internationalize um, and really take our technology. And that's been because of largely our cross time zone technology. So it's been about looking at a gap in the market for us, taking our existing technology and superpowering it, as you said earlier, Gordon. Um, so we now are able to allow a company to take a process of making an appointment, which Traditionally, we're being told um, by our customers is taking them around 15 minutes, and we are able to streamline that to 40 seconds. So it's about landing on a web page or on an intranet and just picking the time that, that suits both parties and, and making that booking there. 
and that streamlining is, is adding efficiencies which obviously impact on the bottom line. Um, so we hope to be superpowering more, more businesses as, as we go. As we've grown as a business, we have um, continued to benefit from the support that's here in Scotland. Um, Women's Enterprise Scotland was mentioned earlier, and they, for me, have been a fantastic um, resource and, and group of, of very supportive and inspirational women who have, have shown me that, that they can do what I want to do and you know, have spent time to mentor me. I think being having the the benefit of their experience has has revolutionized the way i've taken the business the chamber of commerce as well has has been really fantastic at, at opening up um opportunities for us and i think scotland does that massively well it's about opening doors giving a hand up and and yeah i absolutely um thank everyone who's done that for us at appointed the support has become even more appoint, um, important for um, me because recently I just gave birth to my daughter. She's 12 weeks old tomorrow. And that support has um, you know, helped me to be able to do that alongside running a company. The photo here is um, of myself and Hedy at the Great British Entrepreneurs um, networking event at, at RBS. And it was fantastic to be able to take my daughter along um, to that, she looks like she was yawning, she was heckling, it was fine. Um, but it, I feel so lucky to have what I believe are the two best jobs in the world, that of a startup CEO and of a mum. Um, that's being made possible by um, fantastic shared parental leave. Um, so my husband is um, the operations director of another startup, so we have two startups and a baby in our family at the moment. Um, but he is just taking over in the parental um, taking over the responsibility for the care, that's allowing me to come back and, and focus on the business. That is so impactful, and I think, you know, that we're not probably still doing enough to support women to grow. It is a sad fact that most women are in the lower-paid um, roles, the part-time roles. 20% of um, SMEs in Scotland are majority owned by women, and that just feels a really sad fact. There are so many fantastic women out there running businesses, and the stats around kind of women running businesses and the successes that that, that creates uh, are amazing, so there should be more of us doing it. Um, the statistic that kind of blew my mind was that if women started business at the same rate as men, that would be an additional 7.6 billion to the Scottish economy which blows your mind, but even more so when you realise that that's the impact that is expected to be um, the impact of Brexit on the, social, on the Scottish economy. So women have the power to negate Brexit. How amazing is that? <laughs> um, let's do it. Um, so to finish, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I definitely think it takes a village, if not a country, to raise a start-up. Um, Nora talked earlier about technology underpinning economic growth, and I can't agree with you more. I think um, the politicians in the room, I would love to see us doing more to get IT into schools earlier um, and, and wider. It's about attracting companies here, technology companies to, to headquarter in Scotland, um, and doing more to support women and to really make sure that the funding stays in place for things like the Scottish Edge um, Awards, the Scottish Enterprise, um, for SIB, and those, those kind of support networks. For the rest of us, I think it's just about buying from startups. It's about investing in startups. It's about being generous with your advice and your intros, about giving that hand up. Um, because I do think that Scotland can and probably is the best place in the world to start a company. But in a room like this, we have the power to transform um, SMEs and startups. And that in itself has the power to transform the Scottish economy. Thank you. Leah, thank you very much for sharing uh, those insights. Uh, that was really uh, stimulating and very successful. Uh, and I wish you well with the baby as well. Uh, can I now invite the First Minister, not by first name, but the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP, to present the views of the Scottish Government? First Minister. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you to both uh, Nora and Leah for extremely inspiring words. I was struck, particularly Leah, by your comment that women have the power to negate Brexit. I'll be passing that on to the Prime Minister as soon as I, I leave the, the chamber. Um, 
a very warm welcome to all of you to the, the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament. It's always uh, really uh, good to look around Parliament and see it filled with different faces. No disrespect to my MSP colleagues that uh, are in the Chamber. And standing here looking at the Chamber is a very different perspective for me. I'm usually sitting there uh, being held in order or not, as the case may be, by the presiding officer. So it's interesting to stand uh, here looking out on you today. Uh, after Nora and Leah, I, I fear I have to start with something of a, a disappointing admission. I've never dressed up either as Mr Blobby or a banana or any other piece of fruit. Um, and Gordon, my new career as a scientist, I'm afraid, is just a figment of that particular magazine's imagination. Uh, like you, my pre-politics career was in the law, which makes me one of the few people uh, who rose in public esteem when I entered politics. <laughs> There's not many people uh, who can say that. Uh, but it is a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. These business and parliament conferences were first established back in 2004. And when they started, uh, one of my predecessors as First Minister, Jack, now Lord McConnell, said that they offered the chance of a new relationship between this parliament and businesses. And they certainly, in my view, exemplify the accessibility and the openness that people want and desire from their parliament. And from my perspective, and I hope from all of yours as well, they've become very valuable indeed. I'm grateful to Gordon and the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for their role in organising this year's event. It is great to have so many people here with us from the business community to debate and discuss the future economic direction of the country. Uh, I know you'll be discussing a wide range of issues at the workshops that MSPs are hosting later on this morning, uh, from public procurement to city region deals to how business, the parliament and the government can best work together. Obviously, I don't have time to go into all of these issues in detail this morning, but I will try to touch on most of them. Uh, but most of all, I, I want to focus on the key theme of this event, unlocking Scotland's potential. Uh, it's exactly a month ago uh, that I gave a speech uh, in Presswick setting out the Scottish Government's vision for the Scottish economy. At this, which is for Scotland as it is for so many uh, countries across the world, at a time of transition in our economy. Uh, and of course, at the start of the month, I uh, stood at that uh, position over there and outlined our programme for government for the year ahead. Uh, some very specific parts of that programme I know have been welcomed by the business community. For example, there is, I believe, broad support for the key proposals made by the Barclay Review on non-domestic rates. As uh, Derek Mackay indicated a couple of weeks ago, we will implement the majority of these proposals as quickly as possible. Uh, but more generally, uh, that programme for government set out how we want to equip Scotland's economy for the challenges and the opportunities, not just of the coming year, but of the coming decade. Uh, we made it clear, uh, and Nora referred to this in her remarks, that in an age of rapid technological and social transformation, what we must aspire in Scotland to do is lead that change, not trail in its wake. Uh, we must aspire to be uh, the inventor, the designer, the producer of the innovations that will shape our future uh, and not just a, a passive consumer of those innovations. Now that's an ambitious aim, but I firmly believe it is an achievable aim for Scotland. Uh, and we, we know that because it's already happening in some key areas. If you look at digital technology, uh, companies like Skyscanner and FanDuel, founded in Scotland and now companies with global reputation. Scotland is an acknowledged leader in areas like informatics and data analysis. And of course, we've just heard uh, a, a quite inspirational talk from Leah about her journey uh, with a, a startup uh, that is now doing uh, very uh, well indeed. Uh, and you can look also at the low carbon sector. Uh, Scotland currently is home to the world's largest tidal power array and the world's largest floating offshore wind farm. 
We also have major strengths in areas like battery storage and smart grids. And that, incidentally, is one reason why we have set very clear targets that Scotland will be an early adopter of electric cars and ultra low emission vehicles. Uh, we believe here, as in many other areas, we can create certainty and we can create real incentive for business investors uh, if we are clear in our own intentions and our own targets. And in doing that, if you take uh, electric vehicles as an example, we can create economic benefits as well as important environmental benefits. If we look at other parts of the economy, our life sciences sector employs almost 40,000 people. Uh, in an area like uh, sensor systems, companies in Scotland are employing more than 18,000 people. Glasgow, my home city, now manufactures more space satellites than any other city anywhere in Europe. Uh, and the key point is this. Businesses across the country are already creating jobs and making really important advances in some of the key industries of the future, uh, not just for Scotland, but for uh, the world. So the programme for government that we set out announced a range of further steps to support business growth in these and other sectors. Uh, we announced in particular that Benny Higgins, uh, currently CEO of Tesco Bank, will lead work for us on developing a new national investment bank, uh, an institution that will be uh, intended to provide the long-term patient capital, particularly in the higher risk areas of innovation that businesses really need to succeed, but now can find it quite hard to access. We also confirmed the next steps in setting up a new National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, recognising that advanced manufacturing will be one of the key sectors for the future. Uh, and we announced steps to further support uh, a range of sectors from fintech, financial technology, uh, through to the screen sector, an area where we're doing well but have the potential to do even better. Uh, we've committed as well an additional £45 million over the next three years to support business expenditure on research and development. Scotland does well in academic research and development, but we lag behind in business R&D, and that's an area where we have to catch up. Government can't do it all on its own, but we can play our part in encouraging and incentivising, and that's what we intend to do. Uh, one point that I think it's important to emphasise is that this determination to support ambitious companies, promote innovation and encourage entrepreneurship isn't simply about new sectors, although that is clearly important. It's also relevant to many uh, longer established industries. Uh, I see Sarine Wood joining us today. Innovation, as he knows, has been and will continue to be central to maintaining the competitiveness of the oil and gas sectors uh, during the tough times they've seen in the past three years and as it uh, moves into uh, a period of recovery. Uh, that focus on innovation is also really important in the development of our food and drink sector, which is currently going through uh, something of a, a golden age. Uh, there are ambitious and successful companies in every sector of the Scottish economy uh, and in every part of the country. And of course, for uh, many companies, the key issue isn't about whether they develop new technologies or products. It can often be more about how quickly uh, they adopt new technologies or methods, something that Nora uh, referred to in her remarks. Uh, and as she said, that remains a, a challenge for us. And uh, I was struck by Leah's comment about the importance of getting IT uh, more embedded uh, in our school curriculum. Uh, that's why our, our Digital Boost programme, for example, offers advice and workshops to companies looking to use or upgrade digital technology. Uh, and it's good to see that one of the workshops today focuses on e-commerce, something where I think there's still uh, huge potential for us to do better. We need to both encourage and enable more of our small and medium-sized businesses to sell their products online. Uh, that's good for business growth, particularly in uh, rural areas, but it will also help, as Nora said, to boost our productivity. Uh, and boosting our productivity is a key challenge. Over the past few years, we've uh, more or less closed the productivity gap with the rest of the UK, and that's, that, that's a good thing. Uh, our challenge now is to close the gap with other uh, European competitors. Uh, there are obviously a range of other issues which are directly relevant to the mission of encouraging innovation and promoting 
productivity, uh, our continuing support for skills is essential. The strategic board of the enterprise and skills agencies that uh, Nora will chair will have a really important role to play here. Procurement also has a big part to play uh, in some areas, such as the link between life sciences and the health service. Procurement can help very directly in supporting innovation. Uh, and promoting a culture of entrepreneurship is vital. I had the privilege last night of speaking at the Converge Challenge Awards in Glasgow. Uh, many of you will uh, know there about encouraging staff, students and graduates of universities and research institutes to start up new companies. Uh, this year's awards featured more than 200 entrants and all of them, especially the finalists and the winners, were quite extraordinary examples of the talent and ambition and the ideas that we can see in startups right across the country. And that's hugely important as we look to the future. And to Lee, I would say we remain absolutely committed to supporting organisations like eSpark, uh, the other incubators we see across the country, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem that is now developing with such strength across the country. Uh, one of the other issues, one of the uh, final issues I want to focus on, though, today is internationalisation. Uh, we know that innovation is inextricably linked to internationalisation. Uh, we know that companies that export are more likely to learn new ideas, adopt new technologies and grow in confidence and ambition. So encouraging exports isn't simply a good thing to do in itself, although it undoubtedly is. It's also really important to that shared aim of raising productivity. Uh, Brexit clearly forms an important part of the context to our work here, but I don't want to uh, focus on that for too long today. Uh, suffice to say that uh, I suspect you know the Scottish Government's view. We believe that uh, if the UK is going to leave the EU, something we regret, then it should seek to remain a full member of the single market, because that's in the best interests of our economy. Uh, but the main point I want to make around Brexit this morning is actually that it heightens the importance of many of the steps that I've been talking about today. And it makes even more important that we work together to ensure that we remain an open, outward-looking, internationalist country. Part of that, of course, is about remaining open to workers from overseas. Uh, we know that we have a, a demographic challenge as a country. The hard fact is we need to be attracting the best and the brightest talent from other countries to come and make a contribution here. So in everything we do, whether that's as government, as business, uh, but also just as colleagues, neighbours, friends, we need to send out the strongest message to EU citizens that we value the contribution they make here in Scotland and we want to see them continue to make this country their home. But we also need to do more to promote Scottish businesses in international markets. Uh, I should say we've had some real success in doing that in recent years. The value of our international exports has increased by two-fifths over the last seven years. But it is still the case, and, and this is a statistic that you know, bears repetition. Uh, it's still the case that just 70 companies across our country account for more than half of our exports. Now, that I, I think is, is a statistic that is quite mind-blowing. And you can see it in two ways, and we should probably see it as both. You can see that as a, a major challenge, uh, because it is. But more importantly, we should see that as a major opportunity when we think about all those companies across our country right now that don't export, but may have the potential to do so. So we must uh, think uh, constantly about how we broaden our export base and encourage more companies, particularly in the SME sector, to raise their ambitions. Uh, at a local level, the, the government is working with the Chambers of Commerce Network to do that, and Nora was instrumental in her past role with uh, the Chambers in uh, putting that partnership together. Uh, I'll be going to Ireland next week to address the Dublin Chamber of Commerce and uh, I know that Glasgow Chambers will be sending a delegation at the same time. And you know, to take Ireland just an example, uh, it's Scotland's sixth biggest export market and there are massive opportunities in building even better links uh, with Irish businesses. We're also appointing a network of trade envoys to champion Scottish exports and increasing Scottish Development International's representation across Europe. 
In the last year, we have set up innovation and investment hubs in Dublin and in London and are now establishing further hubs in Paris and Berlin and looking to strengthen our existing presence in Brussels. Uh, but we need to do even more and I hope that today's workshop on internationalisation leads to good ideas which the Parliament, the Government and business can take forward together because it is vital that we see this as a partnership uh, challenge. So we are uh, committed uh, to and determined to work with you to build an ever more innovative, open and dynamic economy. Uh, as part of that, of course, we want to make sure, uh, not just that Scotland is growing more strongly, but that that growth is fair, sustainable and inclusive. Uh, we know that inequality, and there's a wealth of evidence now to uh, back this up, inequality holds back economic growth. Uh, stands to reason that we will do better as a country if every individual in every region has a fair chance to flourish. So that case for inclusive growth is based on economic arguments as well as moral arguments. Uh, and there is a very important local and regional element to that. Uh, we must make sure that all parts of the country uh, can contribute to growth. That's why city-region deals uh, and the proposed islands deal uh, and the deals being discussed for regions like Ayrshire in the south of Scotland are so important. And I'm glad to see that these are also being discussed in the workshops later on. Uh, but inclusion is also about individuals. It's about making sure that each and every person has a fair chance to contribute to and benefit from economic growth. Uh, that's why in the longer term, policies that are not immediately thought of as economic policies, uh, policies like the expansion of childcare or work to raise attainment in schools are as important to our long-term economic health as they are to the health of society. And it's why we also attach such importance to the living wage, the Fair Work Convention and the Scottish Business Pledge. Uh, when I last spoke at uh, the Business and Parliament session, we had about 300 companies across the country uh, who had become accredited living wage employers. Uh, there are now more than 900, and that is a, a figure that is growing all the time. We have a higher proportion of workers paid the real living wage in Scotland than is the case in any other part of the UK. So that's something to celebrate. Uh, we are very fortunate in Scotland that so many of our leading companies, as well as being innovative, dynamic, uh, ambitious and very successful, already recognise the obligations that they have to their employees. And we know that others will uh, want to do so, uh, which is why uh, seeing one of today's workshops focused on boosting productivity through inclusive employment practices is so important. So Fair Work, I think, is a good example uh, of one of the areas where the government, trade unions, employees uh, have to work in partnership. And that, I guess, uh, in closing, is one of the key points I want to make today. I recognise uh, the, the key responsibility of government to lead work, to make our economy as competitive as possible. But it's not something government can do alone. All of this is about collaboration and partnership and all of us working together, uh, which is why this event is so important. Uh, I started out uh, by quoting Lord McConnell's remarks at the first ever uh, Business and Parliament session. At that same event, uh, George Reid, who was in the presiding officer's chair, expressed the hope that by sitting together and debating, questioning and arguing, our politicians and business community will forge a better understanding of each other's role in building a better Scotland. So I hope that today's event, like its predecessors, will contribute towards that goal. Because by discussing the key issues that we face, by developing that sense of common endeavour, uh, we will uh, be more successful in making Scotland a wealthier and a fairer nation. And we will make uh, together significant strides towards unlocking Scotland's potential. So I wish you all uh, the very best for a productive morning. Uh, and I very much look for forward to working with all of you in the months and the years to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, First Minister, uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. In fact, for your time this morning. Uh, and we're now going to uh, shortly going to have about half an hour uh, for tea and coffee uh, down in the garden lobby and for us all to mull over uh, the insights shared by all our uh, contributors and uh, keynote speakers this morning. 
Uh, I'm going to ask in a few seconds when we close the session, uh, Lindsay and the team will come down and just uh, guide you down to the garden lobby and also tell you where all the workshops are going to be when we reconvene for the workshop sessions. At 12.20, we will then reconvene in here and you'll have a chance to put your questions to uh, a panel of leading politicians. But until then, thank you very much and I close this particular session. Thank <laughs> you.